Hey everybody, it's Jason Blaha here, and once again it is time for the Q&As. We're going to continue with a new format which people really seem to like, and that is where I ask all the general fitness questions first. The first seven questions or so, then I do a few questions relating to exogenous hormones of some matter, whether it's uh, what athletes do, whether it's therapeutic, uh, under the care of a medical doctor, general questions about that. And then the final question is going to be an off-topic question as usual. And this time, someone it's someone coming to live in the United States is asking me some questions about uh, concealed carry laws in the U.S. and what's allowed and what isn't allowed there. And so for people who aren't interested in any of the latter questions, you guys can tune out once we get done with the general questions. And for people who want to hear those, you can stick around. So let's get this started. First question. How long do you recommend the bench pause to be? A set time or literally just make the bar dead stop and motionless to prevent touch and go for building strength from the bottom? If you're just trying to build extra strength from the bottom, the explosive power out of the bottom, and you're trying to get more pec engagement, just a brief pause, a 1-1000 or even a half count off the chest, come to a stop, let it sink into your chest, half count, press up. If you're really trying to get a lot more explosive off the chest because it's your weakest link in powerlifting meets, a lot of powerlifters are going to do extended pauses. I've seen guys do one second, two second, even three second pauses sometimes. And again, remember, touch and go does have its place. I personally do touch and go right now, even though I recommend that the majority of guys out there, 90% of them do a brief pause on the chest. But it has to do with correcting muscle imbalances in myself. So it's not my general go-to. I don't recommend touch and go for most. But remember, for what you're talking about, just to build extra power off the chest, which also involves developing larger pecs, more developed pecs, a brief pause, just a pause and press. Half a second to one second should be more than sufficient. The main thing you're looking for is to get the bar to come to a dead stop and know that it's at a dead stop and then go so that there's no touch and go and particularly no bounce because nothing will slow down your ability to develop power off the chest and to develop a more powerful chest itself than uh, letting the bar bounce at all. All right, next question. Dear Jason, do you actually enjoy lifting or strength training? How important do you feel that finding a strength training program that is more enjoyable, even if less effective, is uh, really interested in your views on this? Thanks. You know, this is not a straightforward question. This is really a complicated question. There's a lot of different things to consider. I personally enjoy strength training the most. I enjoy power training the most. I'm not currently power training because I need to recomposition more and balance my physique a little more. And a lot of people have noticed uh, that that is working. And that's mainly because it's to improve my YouTube outreach. If I don't look the part more and more over time, particularly at my age, it becomes more difficult to build a fitness-based YouTube audience. So my training is actually geared more towards my professional endeavor there. And a lot of people don't realize that, yeah, my YouTube is a professional endeavor. I make, like Mark Lobbiner implying I make $60 a day on YouTube, uh, it's not exactly correct. So for me, it is a professional endeavor that I'm now doing a lot more high reps, a lot of high rep curls, high rep tricep extension, side laterals. The fact that I'm really not doing under about five reps, even though my major compounds, I love doing one to three rep ranges. So I love to train on big movements, deadlifts and things. I'm doing everything in the five to 12 rep range these days. And thank you for those who have noticed that. But uh, in that case, I'm not actually doing what I enjoy. I'm doing what I need to do. And therein lies the difference. What people need to ask is that, are you training for your general health and fitness and you need to just get in and make sure that you train? Or do you have a goal that is outside of your own basic health, fitness, and just um, recreational activities? For example, if you compete in something what you like to do needs to become second nature because for a lot of people who compete, winning is what they like to do. Placing well is what they like to do. Doing well in competition is what they enjoy. So they'll take a hit and deal with the sacrifice of following a training program they don't necessarily enjoy. If it is a professional endeavor in some way, a lot of people do these things because they like to make money. They want to make more money. They want to get uh, they have financial incentives, so that's what they like. So they put to the side what they might like in training in order to achieve that. So for those people, no, that's not a factor. They have other external motivations. But if your motivation is simply to get into shape, then any sort of uh, weightlifting that doesn't harm you and is progressive is going to help you just get into shape. It's going to help you be healthier. It's going to help you be fit. So in that case, if that's you, then yeah, picking a training style that you know you'll follow consistently because you enjoy it more becomes dramatically more important because you don't have a large external motivation driving your training. So uh, the importance of it really depends upon your internal versus uh, external motivations as to why you're actually training as to how important it is to pick something that's fun for you. So it could range from not important at all 
to the most important factor in picking what you do. So again, depending on where you're at on that scale. All right, next question. Is there any evidence of a link between weight training and aortic aneurysms? I recently had a checkup and the cardiologist found by ultrasound that my aorta is at the upper uh, limit size. So he said that we could monitor it it, and how fast that it widens it. If I want to train with weights, I should not exceed 30 to 40 kilograms. For what? Chest, legs, arms? I mean, what kind of advice is that? He just pulled something. If he found something, sure, he should inform me. But pulling arbitrary numbers out of thin air? I've only found a couple of papers, both of them the same researchers, and not with uh, any cases linking weightlifting with aortic uh, dissection. But at the same time, the same group says that ultrasound alone is not enough to determine uh, aortic dilation. Thoughts? Yeah, it sounds like your doctor pulled arbitrary numbers out just saying how much you should or shouldn't lift there. However, if he found something you should take it seriously, you should probably back down your training. Now, what I'm going to recommend, like with any other medical thing like this, when a doctor who maybe doesn't know a lot about weightlifting is a good cardiologist but doesn't understand weight training per se, he doesn't exercise himself, doesn't work out, you might want to go find a medical doctor who does know a bit more about training and get a second opinion. Remember, you should always listen to a doctor. When a doctor gives you advice, you better take it seriously because you're dealing with potential life and death. So even though he, he very well could be wrong and he may have pulled arbitrary numbers, you might want to follow his advice for a little while. If you lift only 40 kilos on all your lifts for a short period of time, you're only going to detrain a little bit while you get in and you get a second opinion. Uh, would be my advice to go ahead and follow his instructions and get a second opinion immediately. It might take a week or two. It might take three weeks. You're not going to lose very much progress in that time and you'll regain anything you lose because you'll at least be training on like a severe deload in that case. It's not the end of the world. And if it is potentially life-threatening, then you might have to change what you're doing. And it's unfortunate, but that's the case. And as he could be wrong and sounds like from the data, he very well could be, but are you willing to take that one in 10 chance that he's right? So in the meantime, you should follow your doctor's advice and go get a second opinion. And that's the most important thing to remember with anything medical related. You have a right to get a second opinion. And very oftentimes, the second opinion comes back very different from the first. So it's a matter of finding the right doctor who maybe knows a little more about your specific situation, uh, even though they both might be specialists in the same field. So again, a second opinion is a good idea in general. But do not disregard the advice of a doctor who's telling you something could be potentially life-threatening. All right, next question. Hey, Jason, my season is starting soon. Notice he doesn't say what sport, but it's not going to matter. And wanted to know how I should change my routine. I currently on a four-day upper-lower split. In season, I'll be going to practice six days a week and would only be able to go to the gym Monday and Thursday and sometimes Friday with the games on Friday and Sunday. Thanks. I'm going to recommend if you can only get in twice a week, I'm assuming you play some sort of field sport because you said games. you got to practice six days a week. You're not going to make any progress. Your goals as an in-season athlete, all of your strength and conditioning work and, and hypertrophy work and everything that you're doing in the weight room, your goal is to just keep 95% of it during the season. You should expect to regress slightly, so don't worry about it. You're an in-season athlete. You will regain everything that you lost as soon as the season's over and you go back to your standard uh, program. What I'm going to recommend, you need to run some sort of undulating periodization full body twice a week. Go back to your basic exercises you're doing then, and you need to have probably a heavier day and a lighter day with more volume so that you can undulate it. So maybe your Monday go in and do all your heavy power work, triples and things, and then come in and do your higher volume work, you know, your six to 10 rep stuff uh, with a little more volume on your Thursday workout. Or I would even consider reversing it since you actually have games on Friday. Maybe do your power work on Thursday and then do your volume work on Monday. So that again, a change and overlap of the system. So you're recovering from the more metabolically fatiguing work and focusing just on the power the day before the games. But again, on that power day, whatever, if you're going to do the power the day before the game, you need to keep the volumes very, very low. Meaning come in and do a single heavy three rep set on your big lifts that you ramp up to that's, uh, again, no more than RPE9, just to maintain most of your speed and power, but without particularly fatiguing your peripheral nervous system. So something like that, and then coming in and following up the games on the Monday with the volume work, and then you recover from all the volume through the week so that you have Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday to recover uh, from the metabolic fatigue of both the practice or, or the tr game, all the practice throughout, and then the metabolic work there. And then again, Thursday is just to keep your strength peak and keep your neural efficiency and power a little higher. That's what I would probably recommend for someone on your practice split and game time 
uh, for a field athlete of some type. And remember, you're going to lose a little bit of your progress, but it, again, that's the price you pay for competing in a sport uh, and actually having an end season. All right, next question. Uh, would training for strength in the gym benefit someone in a fight for self-defense or building muscle to take the hits from being stabbed? I am thinking about going to a police academy, so I want to be prepared. Yes, having muscle will make give you an advantage in any sort of physical confrontation, having more muscle and strength. Is it the only determining factor? No, I'm not saying that just because someone is big and strong that they're unkillable or that a jiu-jitsu master isn't going to make a joke out of them doing floor work. What I'm saying is that when all other factors are equal with the same level of training, the stronger individual generally wins a physical conflict without weapons. As far as weapons go, the more muscle and tissue that you have, the more difficult it is to get to vital organs with a knife. The more muscle that you have, the higher your odds of surviving being shot with a, a weaker weapon like a handgun or something. It may not make any real difference with a rifle, but in terms of surviving being shot with a handgun, your chances are much higher if you have a lot more muscle for it to have to penetrate through particularly since criminals are not generally known for picking the best ammo out there. And then the other factor, uh, so outside of the physical conflict, having more muscle mass uh, also gives you more confidence and a stronger physical posture makes you more physically intimidating. That also is something that police officers call officer presence, which will make it uh, less likely for someone to try to engage you and attack you. You're less likely to be attacked or assaulted or have someone really try to fight you as a police officer, if you're walking around carrying an extra 20 pounds of muscle. So it might, in many cases, do the opposite of what some people think. It's not going to let you bully people around more. It's going to make it easier for you to completely avoid physical confrontations and keep things to just words and uh, less violent in general because of the, the slight intimidation factor, particularly when dealing with other men. So it would be useful all around for you if you're going to go into any sort of law enforcement career to, to hit the weight room pretty hard. It would benefit you all around and it would be a good idea and it also the other big thing there it's great for anger management and that's something that police officers need to be aware of police officers who don't have a good outlet for their tempers and anger and things that's where you see some of the problems that you see in police work and getting in the weight room and having a therapeutic and positive way to get your aggression out it's going to reduce the chance that you take that aggression out inappropriately when you're working which you know again will save you a whole lot of trouble down the road all right next question uh, we know that you shouldn't flare your elbows too much on the bench press as it can be too stressful for the rotator cuffs. But doesn't that mean that chest flies are bad for shoulders since that pretty much, that's pretty much what you're doing in the movement? No, it's not. If you look at when we talk about flaring, it's like this. This is flaring on the bench press. Elbows way out here at the bottom. All right. Tucked is down here, but notice what happens with the humerus and everything. When you do flies, what are you doing? You're not out here. I hope you're not out here. That's not a fly. That's not even going to work your chest well. That just it tears your shoulders up. But most flies, watch anyone do a fly. This is what they do. You have a decent amount of elbow tuck at the bottom. And the hands, look at the pronation of the hands. When you're more supinated and you're flared out here, it puts more rotation on the shoulder there. But when you're like this, notice again what happens with everything. Actually, bringing it out here was what you, what you do with a fly to where you supinate the hand instead of pronating it. It changes the angle of everything in the shoulder. So actually, flies done correctly like that uh, are going to give you the same shoulder protection that you have when you tuck your elbows on a bench press. It's actually it's quite safe there if done correctly. You just don't want to have your elbows locked out. That's what you want to avoid is having the elbows locked like this on a fly. But if you've got them bent enough, you're again, if you look at what's happening with the shoulder rotation, it is going to be protective of your shoulder joints. It's perfectly fine if they're done correctly. So no, you don't need to be scared of that at all. Just uh, do the exercise correctly, no problem. All right, next question. I'm a hard gainer who can't gain weight for the life of me, especially fat. I was thinking of trying GOMAD, but I'm not down for all that dairy. Is there a non-dairy GOMAD alternative? All right, the thing that you need to remember is that First of all, a hard gainer generally just means an under eater. You're someone with a low appetite who thinks that they eat a lot, but they don't. When they start tracking their calories consistently, they actually usually eat very low calories. Number two, I saw your picture on the Facebook thing. I looked real quick and you were doing a bunch of endurance events. If you struggle with under eating because you don't have a voracious appetite and you do too much cardio or endurance training, you're going to burn through more calories. And if you're not able to eat enough to compensate for your endurance training, 
it is going to make it impossible for you to gain weight and to gain muscle mass. You might want to cut your endurance work in half. Other than when you're in preparation for some type of event that you're doing, fine, but the rest of the year, cut it down to a reasonable level. The other thing that you need to do is find foods that you enjoy more. Most under eaters that I know always have a whole list of foods that they can't stand to eat. Every guy I've ever met who struggles to gain weight, they can name off the top of their head nine or ten foods that most people like that they just really don't like the taste of. It doesn't taste good to them. They don't enjoy it. I've heard guys say, oh, I just can't stand pasta. I can't stand bread. It doesn't taste good. And those guys walk around at 140 pounds and then claim they can't gain weight when they go uh, lift weights. Well, the issue is that you need to find foods that you enjoy. You just need to get calorie-dense foods, find ones that you enjoy the taste of, and make sure that you're consistently eating at a calorie surplus by tracking it every single day over time. And again, the best way to do that is to avoid bland foods, avoid really high satiety foods other than the ones that you need for basic uh, micronutrient intake. Uh, like vegetables and things but then again you could just switch those over to fruit since you need more calories the fruit can be a higher calorie alternative to your vegetables but yeah in general you need to find foods that you enjoy the taste of so that you can uh, get your calories up and, and get your your palate to the point to where it looks forward to eating because again every single hard gainer i've ever met can list a whole bunch of foods that are standard weight gain foods that they just don't like the taste of so you need to do the opposite of that find the stuff that you do enjoy and start overeating on it and remember, cut the cardio back and endurance training to a reasonable level if you struggle with weight gain. All right, we're done with a general question. Just time to hop over to some of these um, hormone and medication type related questions. And so let's jump into it. All right. Hey, Jason, I know your stance on drugs and sports, but do you think that when a drug using athlete competes in a tested federation is unfair to the drug free ones? Or do you expect them to realize people will do that sort of thing? Uh, I don't reserve moral judgment there. I don't or let me say that. I reserve moral judgment. I don't really have a moral stance on that because on one hand, I do understand that yes, if they have the option of competing in both, that it is very silly. I think it's childish and silly for someone to compete in a tested event while using drugs and cheat on the test when they have the option to compete untested. I think it's childish and silly. Is it immoral? Not really, because the thing is, you're not talking about people going for money here. My concern with the whole fake natty thing is that people are being conned out of money. People are, it's being used for marketing for people to buy products based upon a lie. Whether it's training programs or diets or supplements or anything else, is people are being conned out of their money. If there was no financial component involved, I wouldn't care at all about people being fake natties. Completely irrelevant. Because when it comes to a competitive environment, people will do whatever it takes to win. That's the mindset of every champion. They will win at any cost. And so if they know that they can get away with cheating, they will cheat. That is what a true champion will do. And it's not because they're just cheaters inherently. It's because they're obsessed with winning and they will do whatever it takes to win. Lie, kill, cheat, or steal. They will be number one. And that generally includes outworking other people as well. But it doesn't mean that they're not going to cheat. They're going to do whatever it takes to win. Whether it, mean, it means dedicating their entire life to it, that's what they're going to do. A champion goes in 100% and holds nothing back. And so, yeah, you should expect that you're going to compete against people who do that. That's just a reality. When you go into any sort of competitive sport, you need to understand you will be competing against people on drugs, even if it's drug tested. But uh, So that becomes a non-issue when it comes to real sports that are all tested and they don't have untested federations because you know that the best are all going to be cheating. It's, it's unavoidable. It's just the nature of it. If you're not willing to do whatever it takes to win, then don't get up there and then pretend like you're going to win. But the, when it comes to the other, when they, these amateur sports, whether it's powerlifting or bodybuilding, which isn't really a sport, it's a performing art, but people have the option to compete in both. I think it's just silly and childish for people to cheat in it. And I understand why they do it in bodybuilding because they don't want to use as many drugs. It's the difference between having a $2,000 a year drug bill versus a twenty dollars or $30,000 a year drug bill. Different animal there. So I understand why they do the difference. But when it comes to powerlifting or a performance-based one, when they can go compete untested, it's just childish and silly. I don't think it's immoral. I don't think they're scumbags. I think they're, they're just being silly. And they should probably go over and just do the untested. Just, just to be fair and to behave like an adult. All right. Next question. Jason, hormone-related question. What's the upper end of safe dose to keep testosterone at for any extended period of time in years or decades? 
Uh, this is for a normal healthy male over 35. So long as they regularly had blood work and donate blood every 60 days, would 250 milligrams weekly be of any serious health concern? I like that because you hit the number that I was going to give, 250 milligrams, because that is up to what doctors will prescribe to you. However, the caveat is exactly what you stated. I loved how you worded the question because you actually answered your own question correctly. And I, I like it when people do that. It was just you were looking for someone to second guess you. Uh, in that case, yeah, I'm going to agree. If you're on 250 milligrams of testosterone, even prescription, you're going to need to monitor your blood work closely. That's the big caveat. Your doctor is going to need to look at your blood work regularly over the years, and he's going to need to say yay or nay on something to correct side effects, something to get any health markers back under control, how much hot blood you need to donate. Work with your doctor on this because a doctor will, for some patients, prescribe that much. But again, if you're going to do that for prolonged periods of time, you absolutely need to be under the care of your physician and you need to take their advice very seriously. And if that's done correctly and you can keep your health markers in the normal range, there's no reason you can't live to be 80 or 90 years old doing that. Not a problem, but again, it's about working with your doctor and monitoring things and really paying attention to your health and doing whatever it takes to keep the, that blood work in the normal range in terms of all your various health markers from ranging from red blood cell count to a lipid profile and everything else. So yeah, up to 250 milligrams you can get away with, again, with the caveat of working with your medical doctor on this. All right, next question. Hey Jason, a lot of people say that birth control pills for women is reducing muscle and strength development for women. What is your opinion on this? Is this true or just a myth? Uh, absolute myth. Why would birth control pills reduce that? They generally contain hormones that are mildly anabolic. Estrogen is actually slightly anabolic in both men and women. Is it as anabolic as testosterone? No, nowhere near, but it is anabolic. It helps with building muscle mass. What the concern is with some of the birth control pills is that they might make fat gain a little easier. They might cause a little more water retention. So it's going to make women look a little less muscular potentially, but it shouldn't in any way inhibit their actual muscle gains because uh, estrogen actually causes a slight boost in the production of IGF-1 just like anabolic steroids do. It's just not anywhere near as pronounced as they are at it. So no, it's absolutely not going to limit that. And the same with the progesterone-based ones. Progesterone doesn't inhibit muscle gains either. So that shouldn't be a concern. So I, I don't know where people are getting this from other than maybe some of the women look slightly less muscular because of the estrogen can cause some slight appetite problems and make women eat a little more so they gain a little more fat. And it can be a case of, again, slightly more water retention masking uh, muscle development and definition. So those could be the real concerns. You're not going to gain less muscle. All right, next question and last question of the week. And this one has to do with um, concealed carry laws in the United States. All right, first one may be a bit more tactical channel related, but uh, sub to both, so no bother. How hard, what would be the process if an expat was looking to move to America in regards to concealed carry laws, gun licenses? All right, several things you need to look at. Your question is, not really an American question, it's a state question. You need to figure out what state you're gonna to move to. As far as gun ownership though, there is a federal law in place. As a foreign citizen who is a permanent resident of the United States, as an expat over here, uh, you can get firearms if you can pass all the background checks. However, there is a, a, an extra caveat there. You have to actually get a license. Most American citizens do not require a license to purchase a gun. There's some, some myths there. Ownership doesn't require a license. As a non-citizen, it does require a license. And there's a federal license that you have to apply for through the ATF. You have to pass the same background checks that an American citizen does to purchase a firearm, but you also have to prove that you are a permanent resident of the United States. And you go through a process and you get a license that allows you to possess one. As far as concealed carry or open carry of handguns, the federal government does not have direct oversight over that in the United States. The, that is not an American law there in place for that. The individual 50 states all have their own individual laws regarding handguns and carrying of handguns. All 50 states have a different law. They all have a different licensing process. Uh, some states do not require any license at all. They only require you to be at least 16 years old and be able to legally purchase a firearm, meaning no criminal background, not uh, have been declared mentally defective by a court. They let you just carry openly concealed whatever. Other states like Texas has some of the strictest licensing requirements, which just sounds funny to a lot of people because we're so pro-gun in Texas. Our concealed handgun license is possibly the most difficult one in the country to get. It has the most, uh, the, the most in-depth background check. 
it checks for things that you would be absolutely shocked that it digs into. It digs into your childhood psychological records. It takes six months, and if, for example, you were declared bipolar at age eight, and they find that in your childhood psychological records, and you don't have a psychiatrist write you a letter of clearance, your uh, concealed handgun license will be denied. If you were arrested in another state for domestic violence and not convicted, but were purely arrested and spent the night in jail, you will not be, your license will be rejected. So Texas is extremely strict on their concealed handgun license. So you've got those two extremes to deal with. And also a lot of states, so again, like Texas, they will not allow a non-citizen to have their license. So you have to be a naturalized citizen in order to obtain that license here. Other states, you won't have to have a license at all as long as you get your permit from the federal government to own, you'll be able to carry just fine. So you really need to research the laws uh, for concealed carry or open carry in the individual state in which you plan on moving and realize it will, will be allowed in one state, will not be allowed in another. So you might be able to get a, a license in one state over here as a, as a foreign national, then when you move to another state, they will not let you have a license or let you carry. And you could just be, you could actually drive 20 miles to that next state and find that you can't legally carry there ever. So again, very complex question based upon the individual states. All right, guys, but that's really all I have to say on that today. I hope it's been informative and I will talk to you guys next time.